So the introduction this evening, the title is this is why the purpose of the universe or what me worry. Nobody laughed and, and so I have to think <laughs> we, we've outdone ourselves on popular culture. <laughs> anyway, so most religions have an origin narrative. Genesis, Mahabharata are examples. Uh, Shakyamuni Buddha shewed the addressing the beginnings of the universe and what we would now refer to as astrology. As a matter of fact, when asked he, about the universe, how did it begin, where did it begin, that sort of thing, he basically said, I don't know, go ask an astrologer. Yeah, no, um, but Buddhism did develop origin stories that are essentially cultural narratives. So there will be an origin story in Tibet, there will be an origin story in Buddhism in Japan or China, whatever. They were cultural narratives that got embedded when Buddhism, as Buddhism was adapted. However, there's an underlying narrative that developed in the Mahayana fairly early, and that is Buddha nature. And that becomes a kind of substitute for origin narratives. Uh, and this became a paradigm that pervades East Buddhist thought. And so I'm going to give a little bit of background into Buddha and Buddhism and nature, or Buddha nature. Um, in East Asian Buddhism, all beings, including plant life, rocks, clouds, or entities, any kind of entity, is considered spiritual or metaphysical by conventional wisdom, Western thought. And all these things are considered beings with Buddha nature. So therefore, rocks, trees, clouds, mountains, streams, etc., all have Buddha nature. And while the notion had evolved from early Mahayana, the idea that inanimate beings have Buddha nature was defended by John Ron, whose dates are 711 to 782 of the Tiantai school in China, and thus ensuring its adoption throughout East Asia. We can we can identify that period of time when that concept of Buddha nature, that, that is to say, another way of saying sentiency is in all these quote-unquote inanimate objects. And this leads to a broader Chana. assumption. Mm -hmm. This leads to Chana. Yeah. Chana, yeah. This leads to a broader assumption about the physical nature of the cosmos, the universe, if you will, and consciousness. And the two are inexplicably intertwined in East Asian thought and Buddhism specifically. When I say that they're intertwined, I mean that quite literally. Uh, an example that I'll give is that <coughs> to this day, when, you know, I bet lots of folks here have checked off their license, you know, their driver's license that says, I will donate my organs upon my, if something happens to me, I'll donate my organs, right? And so organ, uh, organs are readily used in this country. In Japan, they have the same needs for livers or kidneys or whatever the case may be, the corneas. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> the Japanese people are really very hesitant to do that. Uh, the Buddhist organizations have said over and over again something that, that people should be doing, but nonetheless, people are really hesitant to do it. And the reason is because consciousness is seen as existing in every atom of your body. And therefore, if the consciousness, if my consciousness is also in my liver, let's say, then do I want to present my consciousness to someone else? That's one way of looking at it. Or if a family says your son has died and could we harvest the liver, the family is likely to say no because they don't want to see their son's consciousness in another body. So when I say that it has real life application, I'm not exaggerating. And we see it in lots of other ways in which that plays itself out. Now, likewise, if we look at the Euro-American worldview, like most people attending tonight's presentation, our worldviews regarding consciousness in the universe were really fashioned by the 16th through 18th centuries 
and natural philosophers such as Newton, Galileo, Locke, Kant, and especially Descartes. Uh, natural philosophers, so-called, because they were describing the nature of the physical world, not only by observation and experimentation, <coughs> They were also writing theological treatises at the same time. And so, something we don't think about, these folks were firmly grounded in the Judeo-Christian writings, thus they were reifying an Abrahamic world that informed the questions they asked and adhered to those basic premises. And a really quick demonstration of how that works in the real world is we know that in the 19th century, Darwin proposed the notion of natural uh, of, of natural selection, and in fact, the notion of evolution had been around for centuries before that. And different, there were different theories. You know, we can go into Lamarckian <clears throat> theories, etc., that all address the issue of evolution. When you get to Asia, and I know this specifically because I remember when I was working on my masters, I had the idea of I've never read any Asian writers who wrote about evolution. And for those who don't know, I'm a biomedical anthropologist by, by training. And so I said, okay, let's check this out. I'm gonna see what, what evolution, what evolutionary schemes look like in Asia. And so I asked my uh, thesis advisor and he s scratched his chin and, and he was actually a, a, theoret a evolutionary theorist. He scratched his thing his chin and he said, yeah, go for it, but I don't know that you're going to find anything. I've never read anything. You know, the contemporary Asian scientists might have some writings on it, but historically, there was no one that was equivalent to Darwin. Well, sure enough, nothing was available. And I realized that's when it struck me on the, on the head. Why would they, why would we in the West be so keen on looking at evolution, yet in Asia, especially East Asia, there was no semblance of an interest in it. I mean, you still had sciences. I mean, Koshin is an acupuncturist, so he studied the equivalent of, of you know, Asian science. And, and I realized it's because in the Abrahamic traditions, we have the tale of Genesis. And it tells us an evolution. We may not look at it today as the evolution that we recognize overall from physics and from astrophysics and biology, but it was an evolutionary scheme. There was no evolutionary scheme in Asia. So it didn't even dawn on them what was the beginning. It, it really just never dawned on them. And so I, I think that demonstrates how, and, and I could point out a lot of areas with, with Galileo, with Newton, etc., how the Judeo-Christian uh, stories, the narratives, really entered in there, the questions they asked in science and how they pursued science. In Asia, you didn't have that same set of circumstances. And so the way they would pursue investigations was very, very different. So the European model uh, has as its basic assumptions, uh, it has as its basis an assumption and reification of a monolith of a monotheistic God. We don't think we think, oh, scientists, they must be atheists. That's from the 19th century. That really didn't begin until late 19th century, as a matter of fact. Before that, you couldn't get published if you were in, in science, in natural science, natural philosophy is what they called it. You couldn't get published unless you had also published theological pieces. That was one of the issues in, in Europe. So a God of creation, omniscience, and omnipresence continued to influence science into the 19th century and through today. I can point out to you ways, because it's something that, I, that I've really taken uh, a study of. In medicine, we see it continuously. An example is, how do we determine that someone is brain dead in order to take the organs? It's based upon, well, I mean, in order to take the organs, someone must be brain dead. That makes the assumption that that's where the consciousness resides, is up here. In Asia, you don't have that same set of assumptions. 
That came from Descartes. I think, therefore I am. And so the assumptions are really thoroughly embedded in how we look at the world around us. Oh, I didn't. Sorry, um, folks, I didn't give you the pretty pictures. <laughs> <laughs> So that was, that was the, oh, not that. Wait a second. I'm so fascinated with myself that I'm not giving you the right order of things here. Um, so in Asia, there was a similar development so far as the Vedic, Buddhist, Confucianist, Taoist, and Persian philosophers were grounding their views of the universe and consciousness in a very different set of assumptions. You had the assumptions in Europe. And now you have the assumptions in Asia. And through observation, what we now refer to as thought experiments and empirical methods, in Asia they were using empirical methods as part of their scientific discovery, the Asian model perceives the natural world as having been continually, continuously changing and filled with sentiency. This sentiency pervades all aspects of the daily experiences and the sentiency is free from creation or omniscience. And that's really important. When we think of sentiency in a Western context, if you ask something what's sentient, they'll say, well, it has to be an animal, typically. You know, something that moves, something that has a neurologic system that's responding to its environment, that sort of thing. Um, although, you know, we, we have Recently, we've had such documentaries as what's called Fantastic, Fantastic Fungi, which demonstrates the degree to which there is a form of sentiency among fungus. Um, it's the fabric of the universe. That is to say, um, consciousness. It's present in each dust particle and in a far off galaxy, the quarks of which are part of our corporeal body. As Ichishima Sensei was very fond of saying, you see this? This is a star. <laughs> this is composed of stars. And he's absolutely right. Everything that's in your body was once part of the rest of the universe. It can't be anything else, yep. right? Um, and so the trees, the streams, everything is really part of the same universe that we, that we occupy. And there's a consistent distinction between these two well-developed traditions. And one is the European-based and the other is the Asian-based. And then we get to the purposeful universe, which is what I would like to, how did I, I discussed, oh, I, you know, I got them out of sequence. That's what happened. I think I said earlier, I didn't check this through before I <laughs> did it. So what I'd like to discuss, and there's the Asian perspective. <laughs> there it is. Sorry about that, everyone. Mm -hmm. So we get to the purposeful universe. And the Euro-American view is a dualistic notion of the universe. And this is antithetical to the Buddhist teachings about the nature of reality. This, there is an alternative that uses Western philosophy and Eastern teachings. Neither atheism nor theism adequately explains reality. This is why we must consider the middle ground between the two. Philip Goff. In other words, when we talk about, when in the West, we talk about someone as being, someone will, will state, I'm an atheist, or they'll say, I believe in God, whatever the situation may be. That's dualistic. That's assuming that it has to be either or. That it's one or the other. Philip Goff, and I would have to say a whole group of folks who have been really writing in the last, um, I don't know how many years now, have really... Begun, well, it's, it's really almost 40 years. Most of, I think the first time, well, I'll get to that, but it's been about 40 years we've been really examining something other than that. Starting in the early 1980s, mathematicians, philosophers, physicists, neurobiologists, anthropologists 
Notice I didn't mention psychologists, and it's interesting because they were never really part of this. I found that to be really interesting. Uh, we're exploring conscious, what began, became known as consciousness studies. And you can see articles in the professional publications regarding these subjects. I remember articles in anthropology journals, physics journals, biology journals, etc. And then in 1994, the formal recognition of consciousness studies came into being with the first conference held at the University of Arizona. And these conferences have been held yearly since then. And programs and departments of consciousness studies have developed around the world. As a matter of fact, Philip Goff, as you'll learn in a few moments, is a professor, professor of consciousness studies at, I think it's Durham University in England. One of the leaders in the field today, Philip Goff, for the first time, it's Philip Goff, and the first time I became aware of Goff was in 2019 with his book, Galileo's Error, Foundations of the New Science of Consciousness, uh, which I have referenced um, numerous times in the past. People may have heard me mention it. It's a magnificent, uh, it, it's a very thought-provoking work. Um, and Philip Goff, in general, I'll just tell you now, does a really interesting thing. He realizes that philosophy is going to bore the tears out of most people, except <laughs> philosophers, and even them it sometimes bores. And, but, so what he does is, he will tell you, if you're not a philosopher, which chapters to read and which chapters to ignore. <laughs> He'll say, don't even go there. If you're not... If you're not really, you know, if you're not, if you don't have a PhD in philosophy, forget about it. But then what he'll do is in each chapter, he'll basically give his basic premise. And then in the last part of the chapter, he'll say, okay, now if you want a deep dive, go ahead and read it. Otherwise, go to the next chapter. <laughs> so he recognizes the limitations that a lot of people have when it comes to, to reading philosophy. I, for one, find philosophical readings incredibly hard to read. And I think that's why I became interested in Asian philosophy rather than Western philosophy, uh, because I could never understand. I mean, I took courses on Kant and all that and never really understood them very well. Um, Asian philosophy seemed to be more my, my area. Uh, anyway, he, as I said, he's a philosophy professor at Durham University in English. He, he's published a book a year since 19... Uh, I'm sorry, since 2019. Uh, and from an interview he gave in 2018 on panpsychism and the nature of consciousness, and I'll get to panpsychism in a minute. This was in 2018 on CBC Radio. Um, his, and I quote, his studies focus on how consciousness can be part of the scientific worldview, and Goff holds that materialism is incoherent and that dualism leads to the complexity, discontinuity, and mystery. Instead, he advocates a third way, a version of the Russellian idealist monism that attempts to account for reality's intrinsic nature by positing that consciousness is a fundamental, ubiquitous feature of the physical world. He says, quote, the basic commitment is that the fundamental constituents of reality, perhaps electrons and quarks, have incredibly simple forms of experience. Think about that. Why are you saying no? What does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean? It means that when we're talking about what do you say, electrons and quarks, they have experience. And very just simple. as you or I have experience. So they're conscious. Is that right? Yes. Why are they conscious? I already told you. Because they're part of the universe, and the universe itself is conscious. So how could quarks and electrons not be conscious? I mean, it's a very simple syllogism. It doesn't mean they could beat you in chess. <laughs> no, they can't beat you in chess, but they're conscious. So within the last few months, his latest work was published, and this this particular work was based on the previous books and make a logical connection we think that we find in East Asia. And I suggest this book to anyone who may be so inclined or interested in consciousness and 
here's the point, the nature of reality. Now, how many times have you heard me say, Buddhism is a search for the nature of reality? That's the underlying premise of Buddhism. It's a search for the nature of reality. And here is Goff, who's doing a very similar activity, albeit from a different direction. Um, so what are some of the basic assumptions that Goff is making? Um, the first assumption is one in which he details in the first several books, and that is panpsychism. And panpsychism is a theory that the mind is a fundamental feature of the world that exists throughout the universe. And this was proposed in Galileo's era. Goff writes one of the most fascinating developments of modern science is writes that one of the most that one of the most fascinating developments of modern science is a surprising discovery recent decades that the laws of physics are fine-tuned for life. This means for life to be possible, certain numbers and physics had to fall within an incredibly narrow range, like Goldilocks porridge. These numbers had to be just right, not too big and not too small. Perhaps the most striking case is the cosmological constant. The cosmological constant is the number that measures the forces that power the accelerating expansion of the universe. The cosmological constant is an odd number that is extremely small, but non-zero. As Goff writes, you don't tend to find fundamental constants with that kind of value. And by the way, the fundamental constants are something for those of you who studied physics in high school and hasn't looked at it since then. This, the, those constants have been discovered in the last five years. So we're not talking about something that's centuries old. We're talking about things that, that astrophysicists, astrophysicists and mathematicians have been discovering more recently. Um, as Goff writes, you don't tend to find fundamental constants with that kind of value, but it's a good job that it does because the cosmological constants were bigger, a bit bigger, everything would have been forced apart so rapidly that no two particles would ever have met. We're talking about at the beginning of the universe. We would have no stars, no planets, etc. On the other hand, if the cosmological constant was less than zero within a split second, the life would not be possible. The life, be, the life is possible had to be a strange, highly specific category. It in fact occupies extreme close to zero without crossing over into the negative. And there are many examples of finely tuned constants in current physics. Okay. So, <clears throat> a proof of a purposeful universe. Now, I haven't mentioned thus far, and it would be a good place to do so. Goff was raised a Roman Catholic, and he became a self-avowed atheist in high school. Just totally, you know, was not interested in the notion of God. Um, and it was a result of his studies that he's currently that he is not currently an atheist, but a non-theist, which is also what Buddhism happens to be, is non-theistic. It's not atheistic, it's non-theistic. In his work, he writes, fundamentally, we face a choice. Either it is a coincidence, Yeah, yeah. Either it is a coincidence that of all possible values that the finely tuned constants of physics may have had, they just happen to have the right values of life. In other words, life is a coincidence, which is often what we think of in Western philosophy is that it's stochastic. It's what? Random. Life is a random sort of thing. What? Caused life on you know there's there's people lots of lots of the thesis are filed in libraries all around the world examining this very notion I mean it's a it's a well of of 
PhD thesis, you know, what, what was the fundamental thing that started life? Can you explain what a finely tuned constant is? Yes, I, I think I mentioned it back before, maybe I didn't know. Like it. a cosmological constant? It's a, they're cosmological constants. An example. It, it, um, an example would be, uh, well, I think, I think I gave one here. Let me go back and get it so I don't step on what I was saying. Um, it's a, a number that measures the forces that powers the accelerating expansion of the universe. The cosmological constant is an odd number. It's extremely small, but non-zero. And when you're talking about finely tuned cosmological constants, it's because the range at which life could develop within that constant is so narrow that one possibility is that life is a coincidence because, you know, you'll see in a, in a few seconds, or the constants have those values because they are right for life. In other words, what Goff and others are maintaining is that these constants cannot just be random numbers. They're consistent. And there's not just one cosmological constant. There's the cosmological constant regarding the expansion of the universe, as an example. But there are many others. And they all, if they go either way, a little bit too plus, a little bit too minus, life would not develop. He continues that the former option is widely improbable. On a conservative estimate, the odds of getting finely tuned constants by chance is less than one, excuse me, is less than 10 to the minus 136th power. That is 10 followed by 136 zeros. That's the chance of that happening. <laughs> Right? So Goff writes, suppose thieves, and this is the example he gives, suppose thieves break into a high security bank and get a 10 digit combination right the first time. There would be an, there would be an option to say, quote, well, maybe they just randomly tried to get the number and it just happened to be the right one. This would clearly be an irrational thing to think, <laughs> as it's too improbable that they would get the right combination by a fluke. But the fine-tuning being a fluke is massively more improbable than the thieves getting the combination right by chance, taking fine-tuning to be a matter of luck is just not a rational option. And I could go on this discussion more, but I'll, I'll leave it there. You, you get the idea though, right? Yeah. The latter option amounts to a belief that something at a fundamental level of reality is directed toward the emergence of life, and he would call this a kind of fundamental goal directedness or cosmic purpose. In an earlier paper, he writes that as society were somewhere, some, that he writes that as a society, we are somewhat in denial about this tuning because it doesn't fit the picture of science that we've gotten used to. And he goes on to later to say, I believe we're in a similar situation now with respect to the mounting evidence for cosmic purpose. We're ignoring what is lying in plain view because it doesn't fit with our version of reality. And we've got to use it. Future generations will mark us for our intransigence if we don't. Is this the right one? Yeah. So, Goff conclu concludes. Did you have a question? No. Goff concludes God provides an explanation for fine tuning, but a very poor one. Maybe the poor ancestors, maybe our, our ancestors, made sense of the God that was so much greater than us and what we can do that he liked his creatures. More progress has taught us that. Each individual has fundamental rights that nobody, no matter how powerful and cognitively sophisticated, are permitted to infringe. A supernatural designer 
comes with a parsimony of costs, meaning that in science, essentially, we aspire to find out if any old, if just any old theory that accounts for the data, but what is the simplest such theory? So in other words, parsimony of costs <laughs> is that in science, it's, act, act, was it um, the razor? Occam's, Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is often the correct one, right? Um, for these reasons, I think overall best theory of cosmic purpose is cos what he refers to as cosmopsychism, the view that the universe itself is conscious and has a conscious mind with its own goals. Its own goals. With its own goals. <laughs> that goal, it's not it's not a form of it's not a form of God, it's a form, now, uh, I'm going someplace with this. <laughs> it's not a form of God, it's, it's, so it's not, uh, what, what's the term that, the people, creation science, it's not like a creation science. That's not what he's saying whatsoever. And by goals, he's not saying that there's a prime mover. That would be a God. He's denying that there is a omniscient, omnipotent God. But he's saying that there is something else. An intelligence? An instinct. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know that we People could even call it. People use that phrase. Yeah, right. yeah we use the, the, the terms. <laughs> yeah, I, but I'm not even sure that that's what he means by okay. it. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm, not sure that, that in, I'm not sure that he would use the An term organization. intelligence. Organization. I've never read it in his books. Yeah, okay. I've read five okay. of his books. Okay. And I've never read that, that term in his books. Okay. So just think about that for a moment now. That the universe, it, two things. First is the notion of panpsychism. And by the way, panpsychism started in the 19th century. People like Bertram Russell, Henry James, a number of others were really using the concept of panpsychism in their writings. And like Bertram Russell, the famous mathematician. So it's not something that, that's, that's brand new. However, it sort of lost its luster because of scientism, not science, but the belief that science can answer all questions. If, it, if, it, if we can't answer to, through science, it doesn't have an answer. So, in conclusion, and here's where I bring it around, I will be concise. I, but I got to click on it first here. Uh, I'll be concise. I presented major ideas in Goff's latest book, not because it affirmed Sutra, essentially that which discussed Buddha nature, such as the Nirvana Sutra, but because it provides further thoughts by contemporary scientists and philosophers about how the physical universe and the Buddhist teachings seem to align. Don't take my word for it. Oops. I'm trigger happy here. Ah. Uh, well, that's scary. here we go. <laughs> Don't take my word for it. Dogen pointed out Buddha nature is not something we have, it is something we are. And this something that we are is in is an activity or process that involves all beings. Dogen also emphasized that practice is not something that will give us enlightenment, but instead is the activity of our already enlightened nature or Buddha nature. Hmm. So I'm, what I'm suggesting is, if we accept the notion of Buddhist nature in, in a Buddha nature in Buddhism, which is a common thread throughout not only Mahayana Buddhism, but also Nikaya Buddhism, that this notion of a goal, that a consciousness in the universe and a goal of that consciousness is not in diff is not so different from what we think of as Buddha nature. It really is part and parcel of the same thing. And I'll just here's some of the um, references that I used in this paper, and I'd like to make a few comments about the light, the reference list. Uh, you'll see, of course, Philip Goff books predominate this list and he's directly addressing what I've come to identify as integrative theories of consciousness contrasted with partitioned theories of consciousness. Those are my terms. At the, 
All the other references come from the Journal of Consciousness Studies, and this is a sample, not just cherry-picked selections. In other words, there's some pieces on there that really argue against what I've been suggesting. So I've, I've looked at all the literature. And what I'd like to point out, that the references are that challenge the theory that we presented today, as well as those that, that agree with it. And this is especially true of Daniel Dennett, and somebody, some people may know him. He's a well-regarded philosopher, and is referred to as the one of the four horsemen of the new atheism, mm -hmm. along with Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and the late Christopher Hitchens. In the pro column are Rupert Sheldrake, a biochemist at Cambridge University, a Harvard scholar, researcher of the Royal Society, and plant physiologist in India. His ideas are highly controversial in biology, especially morphic resonance, yeah. though they are gaining a new appreciation in the natural sciences. That <coughs> get back to the idea of fantastic fungi. Morphic resonance would be an <coughs> example of that. And Francis Crick, now deceased, an English molecular biologist, biophysicist, neurologist, he and James Watson, as well as Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkinson, play crucial roles in deciphering the heal heal equal structure of the DNA molecule. What I'd like to point out is that the natural scientists tend to agree with these pr proposed theories a bit more than the philosophers, which is really rather interesting. So it seems to be that these ideas have taken off in the natural sciences and less so among mm -hmm. philosophers. Mm -hmm.